We have so much to be thankful for. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here, to look into your timeless truths of your word. I pray that you might help us to see you, that we would see Jesus, that we would see ourselves, and that you might help us to be more like you. Change can be so difficult. And each one of us, Lord, needs to change. We need to be more like you. There's still a long road in front of us in the way of sanctification. And so today, Lord, we come before you, each one of us in our heart and mind before you to submit ourselves to your authority again, that your spirit might do a work in our heart as we read your word. Pray that you might apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're back in the book of Genesis, and just to remind you, we're in chapter 46. Everybody's moving to Egypt. Now, usually that would be a bad thing, wouldn't it? Egypt is always a picture of the world, and usually people go down to Egypt when there's a problem, but not every single time. In fact, one of the things that God says about his son is that he calls him out of Egypt and what that is referring to in the Old Testament is calling Israel or the people of Israel out of Egypt and delivering them, looking forward to Exodus. But prophetically, it speaks about Jesus. If you remember for a time, Jesus actually ended up with his parents when he was young, went to Egypt to escape being murdered. And so we see that it has a twofold thing coming out of Egypt is a very different thing. But we've seen the story of Joseph and how God has used him and trained him and conditioned him to have a right heart and a right relationship to do the things that he wants him to do. And so we've, we've looked at that and now the culmination of all of this has now come. So last time we were together, we saw finally Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. There was a whole series of things that had to happen for him to do that. And he put them through some, some courses and he was preparing their heart for a right reconciliation, which he did. And so we got to see all of that here last time we were together. He's having a conversation with his brothers and he couldn't stand it any longer. And he just broke down in tears, which he does six times throughout the narrative here in Genesis. And we're going to see one more here in this chapter. He breaks down and then he confesses who he is and he, he has to look at them straight in the eyes and he says, it's me. And they look at him and stare in disbelief. How, how could that be you? We thought, you know, you were, you were gone. And it's an amazing thing when you see somebody who you've done dirty to after a long period of time, you don't know exactly how they're going to respond to you. You guys don't have any trouble like this. I'm so glad... <laughs> You're giving me blank stares like, Pastor Dave, what, what do you mean? If you haven't seen somebody in a long time and the relationship was left on an uneasy footing, it's uh, difficult to have, a con to have a, a, an intersection with them because you don't know where they are. You, you, you might have some issues of your own where you don't want to deal with them. Do you, do you ever see somebody that you don't want to deal with and you just... You do the avoidance thing? Have you ever done that? You shameful people. Shame on you. I, I saw that this morning with me. I was just wondering. Just testing. Yeah, you, it's one of those things. Nobody likes conflict. But Joseph finally breaks down and he tells them, it's me. And for unbelief and, and for astounding mind, they're reeling and not knowing exactly what to do. And so, of course, they, they kind of freeze, which is one of the three things you can do. You know, the other thing is you can flee. <laughs> the other thing is you could fight. <laughs> but they didn't do that. They just froze. And finally, he's trying to convince them, this is me, this is me. And it's, uh, it's always an interesting thing because I remember when Jesus first spoke to me, I didn't recognize his voice or anything about him but eventually I did. I'm glad for that. And so he talks about the elephant in the room. 
you guys did this to me, except he explains to them some interesting theology here in verse seven. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth. In other words, to keep you all alive and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. You see, he explains to his brothers what God was doing with all of this mess with him. And it was all at his expense, not his brother's. And he's like, I just want to let you know, God has been at work here. He sent me here, not you. You thought you threw me in a pit, were going to kill me and sold me off. Uh, and you thought it was all you. Surprise. It was all within God's sphere. It's God's providence. There's no such thing as luck, right? There's God who directs those things. And so he says, it wasn't you. It was God. And so he explains all that to them. And then he tells them what they need to do. And he goes, what you need to do is go get dad and come here because things aren't going so well throughout the world. If you remember the famine, they had seven great years and Joseph was a good manager and collected and he basically doubled the taxes on the people, but they didn't mind because they had plenty. And so they were giving 20%. <laughs> oh, that we could pay 20% tax. But, <laughs> sorry, forgive me. My mind wanders. Wander with me. So he taxes them for 20% and, and he's gathering all this grain. He builds these tremendous silos, stores this stuff underground. That way in the seven lean years that are coming, they'll have enough food. And not just for their own selves, but also for the rest of the known world in that area. And Joseph knows that he's the guy that's going to do this, that God raised him up to do that. And it wasn't an accident and it wasn't an unfortunate thing where he was a victim. God was at hand, you know, God was, had a hand in that. And so he offers to take care of them. And he says, you guys should come and I will take care of you. It's interesting. Not, not only does he show them forgiveness, but he shows them grace abundantly. He's like, you know, no, no problem. I forgive you guys. See you later. Tell dad I said, hi. You know, he could have done that, but he didn't. He says, I want you to bring, I want you to come. I want you to live here. I want you to enjoy the best of the land. I'm going to take care of you. It's rather interesting. Here's the one who got beaten up and thrown in a pit and was neglected and hated. Sounds a lot like Jesus. And he not only forgives us, but he gives us a place to stay, doesn't he? It's called heaven. And he tells us to come and enjoy the best of what he has. So we saw the parallels between Jesus and Joseph. And we're told to forgive, even as Joseph is a really great example of who Jesus will become uh, the fullness of, and certainly a good example of how we should be towards one another. So we looked at that, and of course, we've, we've got this reception. His brothers finally get to the place where they accept it, and they actually receive it. And it's interesting, because the love of God needs to be received, doesn't it? It's one of those things that needs to be understood, and it needs to be received and embraced. Well, of course, I'm preaching to the choir here today, because you guys are here. You're embracing it through celebrating communion and, and looking at the word of God and having fellowship and worshiping God in, in song. So all of this is us receiving that which God gives to us. And much like Randy said, what will I do for the Lord? I'm going to receive. And that blesses God when we're willing to receive the gift that he has for us. And so he says, okay, I want you to leave everything. I, I don't want you packing up any of your old stuff and, and throwing it you know, on a, on a cart and bringing it uh, like a bunch of Beverly Hillbillies. I want you to just come and you'll enjoy the best of the land. You won't have to worry about anything. And he, he gets them all tricked out with chariots and carts and horses and camels and they're loading them up with food and everything else and Joseph is getting him ready to go back. And so he supplies and he mounts them up so that they can go back. It's, it's rather a long trip to go. It's uh, over 80 miles, so it's a bit, it's a bit of a, a trip. So he gets them all set up and he says, just tell dad you know, to come back and I will make sure that you're taken care of. And he begins figuring out how he's gonna do that. But he tells them this, on your way back, I don't want you fighting. I don't want you to get all stirred up. And he says this, see that you do not become troubled along the way. You see, Joseph knows his brothers and he knows something about human nature. 
the conversation on the way back would be, I told you we shouldn't have killed him. Aren't you glad I didn't, I didn't, what do you mean you? You didn't say anything. I was the one, you know. And they're all trying to point the blame at one another. When Joseph forgave them, he was the one that needed to forgive them, right? And he says, don't point at one another and start blaming each other and having that conversation. You know, it's funny when we hold things against somebody else, especially somebody that Christ died for, we're just like these brothers. It's Jesus who needs to forgive us. And if we've received that, who are you to take that sin off the cross and put it on someone? Make sense? And so they go home and they tell their father, Jacob, or Israel, depending on what side of the fence he woke up on today. They tell him, by the way, your son's alive. And he's like, no, forget about it. No way. Couldn't be. He died long ago. And I'm sure they're all looking at each other like, are you going to tell him or should I? This was all our doing. We took his coat, tore it up, and soaked it in blood to get you to believe that. And so they have to come clean. It's a whole lot easier to come clean to another person when you know God's forgiven you. It's a whole lot easier for them to come to dad when it's really Joseph they need forgiveness from. And so it's an interesting thing. Jacob won't believe the truth, but he did believe the lie <laughs> that his son was dead. And it took him a while to kind of get over it. And finally, when he saw the chariots, when he saw the food, when he saw all the stuff that Joseph sent, he goes, all right, that's my son. It's got to be. There's no other explanation for all of this. And so his soul revives. Now, he's about 130 years old. None of you seem to be amazed at that number. He's 130 years old. You don't want to upset an old man at 130 years old with big news like this, but they do. And he finally comes around and his soul revives. He goes, I'm going to go see my son. Let's, let's pack up, boys. Let's, let's go. And so that we talked about that. And it's interesting how Jacob probably had to wrestle with forgiving his boys for this lie that's lasted two decades. You know what it's like to carry a secret like that for 20 years? Can you imagine? 20 years, you know that you sold off the favored son and your dad's brokenhearted about it and you live with that for 20 years. Any of you know what that's like? I, I know what that's like. When you keep a secret like that, it, it just eats you up. It just steals your life. And it affects everything you do. Every word you say, everybody you have a relationship with. And God wants to take that away, doesn't he? We don't have to carry that. We weren't designed to carry that. And so, like Jesus, he forgives. And so do we. So, that's, that was last time. This week, we're going to look at moving to Egypt because they're going to pack up everything and go. I don't, I don't know if you, uh, I'm sure every single one of us had to move at some point in time because we live in New Jersey after all. You know how when you get older, you get more and more stuff? Can you imagine being 130 years old and having to pack up everything you own after 130 years with a gigantic family? That's some serious U-Haul action right there. That's a lot of work. And so they're going to bring everything and they're going to come and they're going to go see Joseph. Now, I'm not sure if they thought it would just be a small interlude or a conversation or a small stay or an overnight or, you know, something where you could get, you know, a red roof in thing. But they were going there for good and they may not know this. But Joseph invites him to come there for good. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 46. So Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba, and he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And so he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Good thing he didn't say he's going to poke you in the eyes. What he means is he will be the one who will close your eyes as you die. 
You see, in the in the movies when people die, you know they, uh, 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 and then they go. That <laughs> doesn't happen. You see, what usually happens is just you just stop breathing when your spirit leaves your body and it's over, and your eyes are very often left in the same place they were when you were breathing. And it's the privilege and the honor and the duty of the person who's closest to close the eyes. So you may not have to do that. We have people that do everything now. But he says he will be the one who closes your eyes. You will, you will be able to rest easy that Joseph isn't going to leave you again. And so God gives him this promise. Well, it's interesting that he goes to Beersheba before he goes to Egypt. Beersheba is, by the way, it's on the way. Um, I, I never am able to make these big enough with the word of God on the screen too. But uh, Beersheba is actually on the way. It's at the bottom of this little red right here. So they're, they're coming from this area, the, the land of Canaan, and they're coming down, going towards Egypt, which is in here. And he stops at Beersheba. Now, if, if you remember anything about Beersheba, this is where he grew up. This is home. This is also where Isaac was. It's also where Abraham put an altar. So Beersheba was a hub, and it was a place where God brought them and gave them peace. If you remember the, the whole digging of the wells and finally came to a well, it's okay. Well, God's given me peace in this place. So it's the, the well of seven lambs. So that's where Beersheba is. It's home. And it's a place where he's met with God before, and the Lord's spoken to him as he's been on the way. You remember when Jacob was running away from his brother Esau? And he gets to Bethel, and God gives him this dream of this kind of an escalator with the angels descending and ascending on this ladder called Jacob's Ladder. It's probably more of a staircase. It's hard to go up and down a ladder, two people. Don't try it. So here he meets with the Lord before going to Egypt. Why would he do that? Because if you remember, his great-grandfather, or his grandfather Abraham, went down to Egypt How'd that work out for him? Not good. He went to a guy called Abimelech, if you remember, and he had to lie about his wife and say, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. And he goes, oh, well, you wouldn't mind if I just, you know, take her then. <laughs> and it happens twice. And if you remember with Isaac, Isaac does the same thing. Going down to Egypt has never been a good thing in the family line. Egypt's a picture of sin. It's a picture of the world. And so he's now going down to Egypt where his son is, and Jacob already is kind of a, a worry wart. Did you get that? You remember when his sons killed all the people of Shechem? And he goes, what is this that you've done to me? And it's really all about him. And he's worried about himself. He's a worry wart. You guys don't believe me. We need to go way back. But anyway, he is. And he's not sure that this is the right thing to do. He's picking up everything and leaving and going to Egypt to see his son. So he's going to check with God first. Good move. Before doing anything that, you're, that you think is dramatic, don't do it when you're in an emotional state. Amen? Yeah. Don't do something. Don't make a big decision when you're in an emotional state. Right? That's like going shopping at Costco when you're hungry. It's just wrong. <laughs> it won't be a good thing. And so what he does is he stops in at Bethel and he calls on the name of the Lord. And there's an altar there. There's an altar there that was put together and he's called on God there before. So has Abraham. So has Isaac. It's the family altar. So he stops in. He's going to ask God, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go or shouldn't I go? And the Lord tells him to go. And he says, don't worry about it. There's three things before going down to Egypt that God confirms in leading him. And there are three things I want you to see in these verses. The first thing is God's presence comes. He speaks to him. We haven't heard this for a while that God spoke to him, right? But God speaks to him and he gives him the, the pleasure of his presence, which is hugely important. Moses said, listen, I'll go anywhere you want me to, God, but you got to go with me or I won't go. And I appreciate that heart. It's like, Lord, I'll, I'll do tough things. I'll go to battle. I'll do anything you want me to do, but I've got to know that you want me to do it. And I've got to know that you go with me. Amen? Amen? Because where God goes and God guides us, he's going to provide for us. 
And we need to know that he's going to be there first of all. And Isaiah 43, 2 says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, says the Lord. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. It brings back memories of how God has preserved his people over time. You remember Shadrach, Reshach, and Abednego? Those guys didn't burn up, and God preserved them. In fact, he was with them in the fire. There was a fourth that looked like the Son of Man in the fire with them. So the Lord gives his presence. It's the first thing he gives. The second thing is his peace. He says, don't worry. Don't fear to go to Egypt. You know, if God tells you not to fear, you, you really shouldn't be fearful, right? Do you all agree with me or just Randy? Okay, good. So what happens if you're afraid when God said, don't be afraid? You're in direct disobedience. But I can't control myself, Pastor Dave. You don't understand. It's not me you got to talk to because God said, do not fear. He said, don't fear. If he calls you to do something, then just do it. And you know what? You might be afraid, but don't let it paralyze you. Be obedient. Do what the Lord's called you to do. I don't know if God's called any one of you to do something very difficult. Do it. Don't be afraid, which means turn your back on fear and face the thing. Deal with it. You know, psychologists have picked this up. You know how you get cured of fears? You face them. Right? A little like a peanut allergy. They give you a little bit of peanut. They give you a little more peanut. They give you a little more. And guess what? You're suddenly not allergic to peanuts. Amazing. Avoiding things just makes them worse. Facing things makes them better. At least it has the possibility of it. Unless you eat a whole fistful of peanuts. So, God's peace. He gives his peace. And he says, do not be afraid. It's a very clear indication of what God wants. Philippians 4, 6 to 7 gives us kind of the recipe. Be anxious for nothing. By the way, that's a command. Don't be afraid about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, don't, don't be a whiner, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So why would I be afraid? Probably because I didn't pray about it. Probably because I didn't give it to the Lord. Probably because I don't trust him with it. I trust myself with it. I'll, I'll make it happen. No. And you will sleep well. <laughs> you will sleep well. If you give everything to God and you say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you. You're going to deal with it because I can't. Like, what are you going to do about the Ukraine? You're going to do something? What are you going to do? Pack up all your guns, go over there and start killing people. Yeah, what are you going to? You know, the God of heaven can change something just like that. So we should really give it to him. God's peace is given to him as he goes. And then the third thing he gets is a promise. He says, I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will also surely bring you up again. So there's the promise of a round trip, by the way. You'll be coming back to the land of promise later. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. So there's this thing where he says, God, God tells him, you don't know what's happening here. Trust me, you're going, but you're going to be coming back. So it's okay. I, I like the round trip problem, you know, you, you know the, the lack of a problem. I, I know of a salesperson uh, and uh, a king of industry who used to send his salespeople out on sales calls and send them out to other states. And they said, well, I only have a one-way ticket. He goes, yeah, that's, that's so you seal the deal. Seal the deal and I'll give you a return ticket. There's a little bit of pressure right there. Yeah, welcome to the 80s. That's the way it was in the 80s. But God's, God's the God of a round trip. And he's going to be with him as he goes, but he also tells him what's going to happen if, ahead of time. And if you remember, there was a prophecy given that they would be slaves in the land of Egypt for a long period of time, but then they would come back. And so God told them a long time ago what was going to happen, and he's reminding him. Because we need reminders, right? In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, 
as some count slackness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, there are people that say, well, if God is real, why didn't he just come down and fix everything? Well, you, you think God's asleep, right? You think he's asleep at the wheel or he doesn't care or he doesn't have enough power to. Those are really the options. But God is patient because he doesn't want anybody that's supposed to be his to not be his. And he knows those things and we don't, right? So you guys should be sharing the gospel a whole lot more and you can speed on the coming of the Lord, as the scripture says. So, Jacob arose from Beersheba and his sons of Israel carried their father Jacob, their little ones and their wives in the carts which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And so they took their livestock and their goods and they had acquired in the land of Canaan and they went to Egypt. Jacob and all his descendants with him, his sons and his sons' sons and his daughters and his sons' daughters and all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. It's, it's such a really great invigorating thing to me because that reminds me of the rapture. But we're going to go all meet the king. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king, right? And that's a little bit what's going on here. It's kind of an analogy of what's going to happen. And notice the entire household goes, everybody, little kids, every. There's nobody left out. There's nobody left behind. Nobody says, ah, dad, you go ahead. I'm I don't want to carry your lazy self all the way down there. I'm going to just, I'm going to hang back here. Or maybe they thought Canaan was a great place to be, so they decided to be there. But the whole household goes. There's not one person that stays behind. I think that's significant. There's none. It's interesting. Jesus said, I will lose none of those. I have lost none of those that you have given to me. But the entire household goes together. Nobody's left behind. And I think that's great. And that's a picture of what the Lord's going to do as well. But he works through households. And I see this going into the New Testament as well. If you remember Cornelius, Cornelius, the first household of, of Gentiles who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. You remember Peter gets this sheet that's lowered and taken up three times because Peter needs everything three times. And he says, don't call unclean what I've called clean. And Peter's like, I have no idea what you're trying to say to me until there's a knock at the door. And there's some Gentiles that say, listen, you got to come see Cornelius. He goes, wait a minute, that sounds Gentile to me. Yeah, it is. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going. And he's starting to get it on the trip. He gets there and he goes, listen, I shouldn't even be here. But God has shown me I shouldn't call unclean what God has cleansed. And so he speaks to Cornelius and Cornelius has his entire household. That means servants, daughters, sons, sons-in-law. He's got everybody gathered to hear what Peter's going to say. And Peter declares Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, the Messiah, who's come to die for our sins so that we might have new life. And they all receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior the entire household. You know, God works in households. I don't know if your entire family are Christians. Not even a groan. Wow, okay. But God works through households. He will use you as a witness. He did here with Cornelius. He said, Cornelius says, who will tell you the words by which you and your household will be saved. That's what the angel told Cornelius. It's going to be you and your household that gets saved. That's a good word to a parent that feels lost and feels like maybe their kids are going astray. Ever have any kids go astray? Good. So I, I pressed a nerve. Good. Because that's a hard thing to deal with, isn't it? Kids that you love and you invest and you teach and you try and you scrimp and save and sacrifice and they just go off and decide they're going to do their own thing. It's absolutely heartbreaking and mind-bending. You do and say things that you wouldn't otherwise do and say. But God works through households. At least he did in Cornelius' household. And you might say, well, Pastor Dave, he, he doesn't always work through households. Just Cornelius. Well, you remember the Philippian jailer? Where Paul and Silas are put in prison and, and they're beaten, bloody, and they're put in stocks. By the way, the, these aren't stocks like you stand there looking silly like in, in uh, you know, Colonial Williamsburg. They put your legs in stocks and they spread your legs as far as they'll go. And then they strap you in. 
So you're as uncomfortable as you could possibly be. And in the middle of the night, they start to worship God because they were found worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. And they worshiped God in that dark place. And the other, <laughs> I'm sure the other prisoners were like, what in the world are they doing? What are they on crack or what's wrong? <laughs> They're worshiping God. And it's interesting because because once the Lord heard what they were doing, he started stomping his foot, I guess, because suddenly there was an earthquake and it racked all those, all the jail doors and all the jail doors were wide open and their stocks were suddenly released from their feet. It tells me that praise is one of those things that frees us. But the Philippian jailers, presuming that everybody escaped, because he wakes up, of course, because everybody's under lock and key, he goes, oh no. The jails are all open. Everybody must have gotten away. So he t pulls his sword out and he gets ready to, to kill himself. And Paul says, no, 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 don't, don't hurt yourself. We're here. And he goes to the Philippian jailer. He's able to share the gospel. The guy takes him home. Paul and Silas takes him home, washes their wounds. And they share the gospel with their household. And their household accepts the Lord Jesus Christ. God works through households. Don't minimize the effect that you may have on your unsaved spouse, children, uncles, neighbors. Don't minimize the effect that you have because God works through households. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, you and your household. It's rather interesting. It's the household. One more. 1 Peter 3.1 tells wives, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Amen. Don't minimize God's effect through you on somebody that may not know him or somebody that might know him, but they're being disobedient. Because you see right here, it says, if some of them don't obey the word, how many of you as Christians have been disobedient? <laughs> oh, there. Oh, okay, good. You're listening. Thank you so much. Good. Me too. I can tell you my wife is God's number one tool to chip away at some of the rough spots in my life. Can I get an amen? amen. So you, she's told you. Good. <laughs> and it's likewise because the number, one, the number one reason for marriage is holiness. It's not reproduction. It's not the continuation of the species. It's not companionship. It's not so somebody tie your shoes when you get old. None of that. It's holiness. And that's the number one purpose for being married. So if you don't want to be holy, stay single. It's much easier. But you see, God works through a household, doesn't he? He works through one member in a household to change others. And ladies, by the way, your greatest weapon against your husband is not your words. And it's not your face. <laughs> roll your eyes. You roll your eyes at me. That's not your greatest tool. Your greatest tool is your conduct, your chaste behavior, your self-controlled, trusting God heart. That is going to do something to your husband. When my wife releases me and she goes, listen, I'm just going to tell you this thing one time. And she tells me one time. And she goes, I'm not going to tell you again. I listen. Because she'll never tell me again. And I'll fall flat on my face and she'll be standing there looking at me. <laughs> Rolling her eyes. No, she won't be there. <laughs> Do not underestimate the power of God working through you as a witness in your household. Amen? Amen. Okay, you guys get that. Good. One more. Well, what if you have an unbelieving spouse? Everybody go, ooh. I know, that's hard, isn't it? That's got to be really hard. The person you picked is the same person, but you've changed. It says here in 1 Corinthians seven sixteen, how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? You see, Paul is telling us, don't underestimate the power of God in your witness at home, in your household. Amen? Amen. 
All right, now I'm done. I'm off that point. Now, this is fun. We've got 70 people here named. Yeah, this is when you're glad you're not my job. Now, these were the names of the children of Israel. Jacob and his sons who went into Egypt. Reuben, who was Jacob's firstborn. <coughs> that was easy. I, I know a sandwich after him. <laughs> the sons of Reuben were Hanuk, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jemin, I like that name, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of the Canaanite woman. We're even given a little uh, background on his mother. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Now, you might recognize those because the Kohathites, and they're involved in worship anyway. The sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, Sh Shelah, and Perez, and Zerah. But Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. You guys remember that story. The sons of Perez were Hezron and Hamuel. The sons of Issachar were Tola, Pava, Job, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun were Sered, Elon, not Elon Musk, <laughs> and Jalil. These were the sons of Leah, whom she bore to Jacob in Padamaram with his daughter Dinah. And all the persons, his sons and his daughters, were 33. The sons of Gad were Ziphon, Haggai, it just keeps going. Shunai, Esbon, Eri, Aradi, and Erili. Er, er, Ereli. The sons of Asher were Jimna, Ishua, Izui, Beriah, and Sarah, their sister. And the sons of Beriah were Heber and Malchiel. These were the sons of Zilpah whom Laban gave to Leah, his daughter, and these she bore to Jacob, 16 persons. The son of Rachel, Jacob's wife, were Joseph and Benjamin. That's the short one. I like that. <laughs> now, why are these things put in the scripture? Well, I can tell you it's really important when you want to follow your family line, especially when the most important person that ever came to earth, Jesus Christ, is related. So it's hugely important to show that it's true. And number two, if you wish to inherit land, this acts as a land document. Say, hey, these are my ancestors. Okay. So, by the way, one little name that you might find interesting on this list is Job. There are scholars who believe that this was the Job from the book of Job, which is considered the oldest book in the Bible, at least the oldest as far as it being penned and written. So we know that Moses wrote the five books, uh, the, the Pentateuch in the beginning, and it may be that he wrote Job as well. So just so that you know, that's who that guy might be. It's trivia in the, in the big long list of names. And we're not done. Verse 20, and Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. The sons of Benjamin were Bala, Becher, Ashbel, Gera, Naaman, Ahai, Rosh, Muppin, Huppin, and Ard. <laughs> These are the sons, I'm, that's just the way they are. These were the sons of Rachel, who were born to Jacob, 14 persons in all. The son of Dan was Hushim. The son of Naphtali were Jazil, Guni, Jezer, and Shilem. These were the sons of Bilhah, the, whom Laban gave to Rachel, his daughter, and she bore these to Jacob, seven persons in all. All the persons who went with Jacob to Egypt, who came from his body, it's an interesting way to put it, besides Jacob's sons and wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons. All the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt were 70. Now, there are some places where it says 70. There are some places where it says 75. I'll let you guys figure out where the other five come from. But anyway, so you, you got a troop of 70 people with all of their stuff moving. 
This is a mass moving. You get that? Okay, good. And so they're all going. From this family of 70 entering into Egypt, God grows to be a nation of 2.1 million when they return. The book of Exodus, when Moses comes and gets them and they go out, they go from a family of 70 to 2.1 million people. 400 years in slavery will do that. But do you understand God's purpose? He calls them out as a family and sends them back as a nation. This is God's work. This is his sovereignty. There are now 23.8 million Jews worldwide, throughout the world. 9.499 million reside in Israel. 51% of them of the Jews are in the USA. Did you know that? I did a lot of digging. And 29% of all the Jews in the United States live in New York. You go, Karen. Okay. <laughs> and, and by the way, there's 8 billion people in our population, so they, they account for like 0.2 of the population of the world. But this is what God did with 70 people. You know, if the Lord tarries and we have children and they have children, I wonder, is there any way of knowing what it is that God could do? I just think it's amazing. God called them out of family and he brought them back as a nation and they're still a nation today. And there'll be a time in which they recognize Jesus Christ to be their savior, their Messiah, the one who came for them. Because God keeps his promises. And then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen and Joseph made ready his chariot and he went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel and he presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept for a good while. And Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. It's an interesting greeting. It's just an interesting greeting. He hasn't seen his son for over 20 years. Thought he was dead. Now he sees his son. And his son isn't just some, some slave that they stumbled across. He's like the number two. That's what his license plate says. He's the number two next to Pharaoh. He's all that and a bunch of chariots. <laughs> Imagine how proud he is to finally see Joseph. And it, and it specifically says that they wept for a good while. That means it got uncomfortable. In, 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 you know what that's like? You ever have somebody fall onto you weeping? And it's like, And they just keep going. And it's like, hey, uh, you know, we're past lunch. You know, like we should, can you sit down? Hopefully you have somebody who can direct that very tactfully. But they wept on each other for a long while. Real men cry, by the way. Just thought I'd bring that up. Rub your face in that. Real men weep when they're deeply moved. This scripture about now I can die since I've seen your face reminds me of Simeon. You remember Simeon's bucket list in the book of Luke. Mary comes and they come to do the sacrifice, you know, that which is the, the pigeons and the whole thing to buy back the firstborn. And they bring him to be dedicated to the temple and they run into Anna, who's this prophetess, who just spends her time in the house of God doing God's work because she's single and she's a widow for a long time. And then there's Simeon, who the Lord spoke to him and told him long ago, you will see my salvation before you close your eyes for the last time. And so Simeon's got this on his bucket list. You know, I'm going to see the Messiah before I die. And of course, 
you know he was a very old man. He and Anna both, they're like the really, you know, golden oldies that hang around the church. And so he says, now that I've seen you, I can die. It's like the last thing on my bucket list. The bucket list is before you kick the bucket, something you have to do. Any of you have a bucket list? Let me see your hands if you have a bucket list. Yeah, don't, just let it go, man. Just let it go, okay? Just let it go. You don't need a bucket list. Luke 2, 28 to 30 says, So he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. So we've got a New Testament guy that's much like the Old Testament guy, but the Old Testament guy is 130 years old. So he's like, now that I've seen you, I can rest. I can close my eyes. Life is good. I got my sons back. I got Simeon who was in prison uh, or Simon who was in prison. I've got um, uh, my, my son um, Benjamin back and now I have Joseph back. I've, I've got it all back. So now I can go home. And Joseph said to his brothers and his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who were in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for the occupation has been to feed livestock for they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? That you shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth even until now both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So Joseph's going to give them the skinny before they go for their interview. And he says, listen, when we go see Pharaoh and I introduce all you guys, make sure you tell him that you're shepherds. Why would I do that? Why do you think he's doing that? Is he telling him to say something that's not true? No, but he is leading the witness. He says, make sure that you tell them that you're shepherds and keep that in mind when you're asked because that's an important feature. Why is it an important feature? Pharaoh is a Jew, but he's living in Egypt like an Egyptian. I'm sure the very first thing his dad said after he was done weeping was, Dad, I'm really glad to see you. And Dad said, what's with the makeup? <laughs> because he looked like an Egyptian. What he's trying to do is protect them so they don't get swallowed alive by the culture in Egypt. Make sure you tell them that you are shepherds, that you take care of flocks because Egyptians hate you guys. Why would I want to tick the guy off? I just met Pharaoh. I'm going to tick him off immediately? Yes, that's what you're supposed to do. Because shepherds get the best land and they also go far away from where all of this worldly thinking and all of this ungodly behavior is happening. And he wants them to be separated. He wants them to get away from the influences of that culture. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like telling your kids, don't hang out with them. But why? Because they carry knives and guns, that's why. Because they're dealing drugs, that's why. Well, we won't deal drugs or handle knives or guns. Darn right you won't. Because you're not going to hang out with those kids. And that's really what he's setting up, okay? He's interceding for them. Isn't it interesting? If there's anybody that could intercede for the Jews, it would be a Jew. And it's anybody who can speak to the Jews about what it is to be Egyptian, it would be Joseph. If there's anybody that can come before the Father on your behalf, it would be Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And if there's anybody who can tell you what you should do, it would be Jesus Christ who was a man who came into human flesh even as we are, just like Joseph was. And Jesus is our intercessor, isn't he? I didn't even plan on saying that. And so we want you to get away from the central hub of this city life where you're going to get degraded by all the stuff that's going on. And so, by the way, the land of Goshen is here. You might hear it called a little bit later the land of Ramses. The land of Ramses is what the name took the place of Goshen. If you said Goshen, people go, what? Go, what's Goshen? 
I thought that was in, isn't that like in Maryland? No. <laughs> Goshen, is, Goshen is right here. And it's right here in this wonderful delta where the Nile pours out. And there's all of this green. You see the green here? That's because that's what it looks like. It's just really, really nice for, for taking all of your animals. Now, largely, Egypt was agrarian, so they grew stuff, okay? They used to be, in the past, they used to herd animals, and that may be why there's some prejudice against people who herd animals, because it's like an old school sort of thing, you know? It's like, oh, you're Amish. Oh, I get it. We're going to let you go over here to your own little world and do whatever you want to do. So that's what he's doing, and that's why he said that. But him being an intercessor is a really good point. So they've moved to Egypt. Everything is done next week. Jacob is going to meet Pharaoh. Old world and new world are going to meet. And it's going to be an interesting thing. Now, remember, they're, in, they're right in the middle of a famine. And now there's suddenly 70 people that showed up to doorstep. So... And they're going to try to figure out what they're going to do. So we'll look at that next week. I hope you guys are enjoying the story of Joseph and seeing the parallels between Jesus and Joseph. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And we'll do one more song for you guys.